Welcome to the second part of the lecture. What we saw up to now told us that uh, the interaction between uh, the stellar radiation and protoplanetary disks uh, creates a temperature gradient inside the disk, which in turn creates a compositional gradient with more or less the, uh, the, uh, the more refractory elements condensing closer to the star and more and more volatile elements increasingly adding up to the condensed planetary materials. And we saw that this is reflected into the compositional gradient that we see in the, minor, in the population of minor bodies in the solar system among the asteroids and the comets. Uh, both comparing the two populations, so asteroids as rocky material closer to the star and comets icy material coming from the outer region of the solar system, but also within uh, the two populations. Asteroids present a gradient uh, with uh, uh, more volatile material appearing in asteroids that are further away from the sun. And uh, similarly, the comets possess different abundance of uh, elements of different volatility, which suggests uh, their formation across a different, uh, wide um, extent of time and space in the disk. The situation up to now would seem reasonably clear and simple. So we have a radial compositional gradients and materials forming at different distances from the star will have a different composition. And this seems to be supported also by extrasolar data. However, up to now, we have not included the presence of planets in the pictures. What happens when uh, we move from the formation of the smaller bodies like the planetesimal to the formation of the planetary bodies like we see today in the solar system and that we observe around the other stars with the exoplanets? What happens is that uh, once a few bodies start reaching the size, uh, a size comprised, uh, comprised between that of the Moon and Mars, so between 1% one, uh, 1 and 10% of that of uh, the Earth, uh, they start uh, to gravitationally uh, accrete all the smaller bodies, growing faster than the other bodies. And these uh, planetary embryos that becomes oligarchs, uh, so the few bodies that grows, the name literally means uh, the few bodies uh, that rule. Uh, as you can see in the simulation on the bottom right, uh, where you have uh, uh, the oligarchs, the planetary embryos in red, uh, that interact with a population of smaller bodies of different colors, which represent, represented the different region from which the planetesimal originated. And, uh, you see that the number of smaller bodies disappear, decrease and also the number of oligarchs until we end up in this simulation with the three terrestrial planets mimicking Venus, the Earth and Mars, more or less. As you can see from this simulation, uh, there is an interaction between uh, these planetary embryos while they grow into oligarchs and then pl uh, terrestrial planets and the population of small bodies cause a complete remixing on the planet of the planetary material. In this size range of the stage of planetary growth, impacts uh, even between large bodies, uh, like uh, between two uh, oligarchs, uh, the red bodies uh, in the, the simulation on the bottom line, tend to be always uh, uh, accretionally. So they can be approximated uh, as a completely inelastic impacts, uh, where uh, the final mass of the remaining bodies is uh, to good approximation, the sum of the mass of the two impacting bodies. We can see this uh, process uh, from another point of view in the simulation here on the left, where you can see uh, the diffusion of volatile elements represented in blue by the fraction of, uh, by bot uh, bodies that uh, possess a larger fraction of water in their composition. And as you can see, bodies. Uh, the blue bodies, the water rich, uh, volatile rich bodies, tend to diffuse into the inner region of the planetary system. The uh, planets that are forming uh, have a color that shifts from red to green and blue across the simulation because they are gathering more and more water from, uh, that, from the bodies that formed uh, into the outer part of the asteroid belt. Notice that in the previous simulation and in this simulation, Jupiter is already present and is the one that is exciting the asteroid belt and causing the bodies to go on orbit and interact. Uh, intersect those of the terrestrial planets. So this fountain 
here, the excitation wave is due to the presence of Jupiter. This process is stochastic in nature. And uh, an example of the, the effect of this uh, stochasticity uh, of the process uh, is shown in the right uh, plot, where you can see, as these cake diagrams, the composition of the planets that are formed in different simulation in terms of material coming from different uh, distances from the sun. Already you can see the process is random and stochastic because the number of planets is not constant and is not constant also the mass of the planets at the end of the simulation, nor the distance. But you can also see that the final planets have a very different composition from one case to the other. And they all include material, a mix of material that comes from the different region. So even if the beginning of the planetary formation process from the protoplanetary disk to the formation of the first generation of planetary bodies create a compositional gradient, the planetary formation process, while it continues in order to form the terrestrial planets, uh, has inbuilt uh, an effect of uh, remixing of the planetary material, which means that uh, we don't find necessarily planets composed by material that was available in situ, but they can contain material that was not uh, original of their uh, formation region, but came from other region because of dynamical encounters, scattering and accretion. Now, I mentioned that in the simulation, Jupiter was already present before the terrestrial planets. Why this? Uh, because uh, if we look at the giant planets in the solar system, the bulk of the mass of Jupiter and Saturn, as well as a large fraction of the uh, mass of Uranus and Neptune, are composed of hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen and helium, if you remember, do, are not um, elements that condense and are available in large amounts in meteorites. And they also don't condense in large amounts as pure hydrogen and helium among the volatiles. Part of them is contained into, for example, ammonia and water, but because the abundance of hydrogen and helium is much higher than that of the other elements, the vast majority of these elements remain always in gas form in disk. So, the giant planets should form before the dispersal of the disk, because otherwise, since hydrogen and helium don't condense in the condition of a protoplanetary disk, there are no sources of hydrogen and helium available for the planets to accrete them um, after the dissipation of the disk. Now, giant planets, according to the data we have for the giant planets for the solar system, are generally thought to form initially in a similar way as the terrestrial planets, like a seed that grows, creating the smaller material around until it reaches a mass of a few earth masses, at which point it starts accreting a um, gas atmosphere from the gas of the disk. The process of accretion of the solid core and of the atmosphere continue at different rates until the gas atmosphere is more or less equal in mass as the solid core. At this point, a process of instability is triggered. The gas is not supported anymore by the thermal pressure and start being rapidly accreted by uh, the core of the giant planet. The fact that the gas collapses on the core means that uh, more space is available for other gas to diffuse and be accreted by the planet. And the process continues rapidly as a cascade until the planet in uh, a few 10, 10 to the five years reaches its final mass, which in the case of Jupiter means that uh, over this time scale, the planet jumps from 30 um, Earth masses to more than 300 Earth masses. So it grows over a factor of 10. Now, up to now, we have talked about the planetary formation as a local process, but is it a local process? If you look at the distribution of the exoplanets we know in terms of orbital distances or orbital periods, which is equivalent, we see that 75% of the, planet, uh, the exoplanets known today orbit at an uh, orbital distance that is associated uh, to orbital periods of uh, 100 days or less. By comparison, the orbital period of Mercury is around 90 days. And given that most of the stars are similar to the sun, this means that the vast majority of the exoplanets we know today, both super Earth and giant planets, orbit closer to the star than Mercury in the solar system. Given that there is not enough mass in these regions to form uh, the cause of giant planets, 
even if we assume 100% efficiency, unless we are missing something in the details of the planetary formation process that we think we know, this suggests that these planets migrate from other regions. And we get a confirmation of this. If we look at the densities of the planets, here you have, uh, again, orbital period and the planetary mass in Jovian masses. Here you have the, joy, uh, the giant planets. Uh, here you have uh, sub-Neptunes to super-Earth planets uh, with a few planets with mass comparable to that of the Earth. And uh, as you can see, in this color scale of the density, where one is the density of uh, water ice and the eight, uh, the red is the density of uh, the iron nickel league that compose the core of uh, terrestrial planets. We don't have any compositional gradient at all. We have a mixture of planets with low density, with planets with um, density compatible with metals, and everything in between. For comparison, the density of the Earth and of the terrestrial planets in the inner solar system is around five. So it's between the transition between, uh, from green to yellow. Again, this uh, lack of any compositional gradient suggests uh, that planets from at different distances from the star were brought there by migration. Now, there are two mechanisms to which a planet can migrate. The first one is by its interaction with the gas in the disk. There is an exchange of angular momentum and the planet can be brought closer to the star by losing angular momentum that is uh, gained by the gas. However, there is another mechanism, and this other mechanism uh, is um, the, the, the role of this other mechanism is actually supported again by the extrasolar data. Because if you look uh, this time at the eccentricity of the orbits of the exoplanets we know, again as a function, a function of the orbital period, for example, we have that 50% of non exoplanets, everything in the red area, has an eccentricity greater than 0 0.1. By comparison, the eccentricity of basically all the planets in the solar system, except for Mercury, are an order of magnitude smaller. Now, we know that eccentricity is generated by interaction with large perturbers or planet planet scattering events, as we saw in the simulation for the formation of the terrestrial planets. The interaction between the embryos, the oligarchs, and the small bodies caused the eccentricity of the small bodies to increase. And uh, if we try instead, uh, if we put uh, uh, eccentricity into the global picture of dynamical excitation, and we compute the dynamical excitation of a planetary system that we know, we see that uh, another important uh, fact. Basically, not only we have a large fraction of uh, planets that have a higher eccentricity, higher than the planets in the solar system. But we also have a large fraction of planetary system as a whole that have a higher dynamical excitation than the solar system. In this plot, you can see a metric of the dynamical excitation that you can see reported here, which is a function on the mass, the major axis, the eccentricity and the relative inclination of the planets in a planetary system as a function of the number of planets in the system. This plot tells us two things. First, a large fraction of the best characterized as exoplanetary system that we know today have excitation higher than that of the solar system. The solar system is not alone in being among the planetary system with low global dynamic excitation and there are system with lower dynamical excitation of the, than the solar system, but a large fraction of the planetary system have higher values of the dynamical excitation. The other uh, thing that we might notice is that there is a decreasing trend in dynamical excitation among, uh, uh, as a function of uh, the number of planets. So systems with fewer planets tend on average to be more dynamically excited than systems with a larger number of planets. Now, the statistical system with a larger number of planets, it is still limited. So it's um, something that we need to be confirmed by future studies when we'll have a better statistic. However, the trend between a system of two, three, up to four and five planets is reasonably robust and shows this uh, 
decreasing trend. This might suggest that uh, some of the most excited systems with a small number of planets in reality were born with higher number of planets and lost uh, some of them due to global scale dynamical instabilities, for example. Remember that dynamical excitation is produced when we have uh, large perturbation in the system or uh, that can be also caused by global instabilities, uh, chaotic dynamics, planet-planet uh, -planet scattering events. Well, generally, smaller uh, dynamical uh, excitation values are associated to more regular evolution. So generally, we seem to say that a large fraction of planetary systems tend to have undergone more violent dynamical histories than the, uh, the solar system, which suggests that there is a, a second pathway, which is not uncommon among planetary systems, that can cause planets to migrate because chaotic evolution, planet-planet scattering, and generally global scale instability. And it is interesting that these kind of uh, processes were proposed also for the solar system, notwithstanding the fact that the solar system was used in the previous plot as a div uh, the division line between uh, highly excited and low, uh, low, uh, less excited planetary system. There are a number of scenarios that have been proposed for the solar system. Uh, some uh, uh, proposing dynamic, uh, global dynamical instabilities, other combining uh, uh, large scale migration with dynamical instabilities. And some of them are even proposing the presence of additional giant planets originally in the solar system and the loss of some of them. This pathway of evolution of the solar system appear even more plausible now that we put them in the context uh, of uh, the dynamical evolution and excitation of exoplanetary system. So it is uh, for this reason that the solar system can be used as a division line uh, between uh, systems that more likely had a violent dynamical history and systems that more likely had a stable and irregular dynamical history. Because uh, for the solar system, we have both classes of scenarios, all of them succeeding in explaining some of the characteristics of the solar system and being more difficult in explaining others. However, we talked about the fact that uh, the final position of giant planets is not necessarily representative of where they formed. And uh, we told them, uh, we, told, uh, we spoke about uh, the formation of the giant planets and the terrestrial planets in the solar system, which seems to indicate uh, that planets form in the first few tens of a U from a planetary system. However, if we look at uh, other second stellar disk, this vision can be challenged. Now, thanks to the um, Atacama large millimeter and submillimeter array of uh, radio telescopes in the South American desert of Atacama in Chile, we've been able in the past uh, six years to get an increasingly higher resolution in the observation of protoplanetary disk. By comparison, here you have a, a vintage image from mid 90s of the protoplanetary disk seen with Hubble. And here you have uh, images of protoplanetary disk seen uh, two years ago by the large program D Sharp of ARM. When giant plants form, they tend to clear the surrounding region by both solid material, dust and planetesimals, and uh, by gas. Because, they are, uh, because of their uh, accretion and the larger gravity that perturbs the, the surrounding region. And uh, this prediction of this gap in the disk of gas and dust uh, surrounding the, the star are actually confirmed by observation of ALMA, where we see a uh, widespread presence of such features as rings and gaps. In some cases, uh, it is possible that some of these features are not actually related to planets, but more likely to the evolution of the disk. However, in other cases, some, like for example, the case of HD 163296, the bottom right disk in this, uh, in this uh, mosaic, there are different lines of indication that suggest that the, these rings are actually caused by the presence of giant planets embedded in disk. However, if you, not, if you look at the bottom end of, of each tile of the mosaic, you will see there is a, a small uh, white bar that represents uh, the scale of 10 astronomical units in that specific image. 
And as you can see, in most of the disk, the features associated to the presence of possible giant planets are much farther away than what we see in the solar system. They go from several tens to hundreds of astronomical units from the star. So the planetary, the giant planet formation region in disk that is suggested by the, these images, images is much different from the one that we would have expected from the structure of the solar system and suggests that large scale migration could be a common uh, stage in the life uh, of planetary system, given also the widespread presence of planets uh, very close distant from the stars revealed by the exoplanets. And what happens when we put giant planets in disk so far away from the star? What happens is that, uh, as we expected, uh, the planets clear a uh, uh, gap also in the planetesimal distribution because of the uh, dynamical perturbation, but because of the gravity of the planets with respect to the gravity of the star becomes much more important in dominating this region, the global effect is that uh, the population of planetesimal gets very dynamically excited and creates a population of exocomets with very high inclinations and very high eccentricities, as you can see in the animation of the excitation process of the disk of HD 163296, the one on the bottom right in the previous slide. This is a, a simulation with the mass closer to the most uh, up-to-date estimates of the mass of the three giant planets. As you can see, a huge population of exocomets with very, very high eccentricity is produced. This is important from the point of view of the composition of the planetary bodies, because this means that this planet is a very stretched orbit that can cause wide region of the planetary system and they can collide and be accreted by body forming very far away from when these planetesimal were formed. Moreover, some of these planetesimal can reach such high eccentricity that they can penetrate the inner regions of the protoplanetary disk where the density of the gas is such that can start circularizing their orbits closer to the pericenter. And this is the cause of this fountain, this cascade of planetesimal toward the inner region. Now, the inner edge of this disk is a 10 astronomical unit, and this means that the presence of giant planets at 50 to 150 astronomical units from the star can excite planetesimal and inject cometary objects rich in uh, ultra volatile elements into the innermost region of the protoplanetary disk, where uh, we would expect analogs of the planets of the solar system to form. So again, the presence of uh, multiple, one or more large perturbances and large distances can also have implication for bodies that are forming into the inner regions. And uh, the fact that uh, planets can form at such large distances means that also in the case of the solar system, we can exclude uh, automatically that the giant planets of the solar system forms a few tens of astronomical units from where we see them now. Here you can see an example uh, of a simulation studying the formation of the four giant planets of the solar system, uh, starting with their seed in the region comprised between 15 and 30 astronomical units, so beyond the orbit of uh, Saturn and more or less around uh, the orbit of Uranus and Neptune. The planets, the seed of the planets start at this distance, but the planets migrate to reach a position uh, closer to the final position. And as you can see, while crossing to this, because of the large mass, planetesimals can uh, be dynamically excited and remixed with a fraction of planetesimals that were formed at very large distances from the star. Here, there are also bodies that formed at uh, 15 to 20 astronomical units, and they can be injected into the asteroid belt. While this would seem extreme, planets, giant planets forming so far away and migrating to the final position, creating such a huge remixing of the planetesimals and therefore the planetary material, there are a number of uh, hints that suggest that this could actually have happened in the solar system. For example, the fact that Vesta and Ceres, two of the uh, asteroids in the asteroid belt and the target of the NASA mission Dawn, both showed the presence of volatile material that uh, was not local to the region where they, uh, the orbital region where they are now and uh, where they plausibly, plausibly formed. 
and suggest that they have created the, the material that was more rich in volatiles than the, the local material for which they were forming, while the protoplanetary disk was still uh, present in the first few million years of the life of the solar system, which excludes a role of the terrestrial planets and the remixing they cause as the source of their accretion of uh, this material. Now, we approach the end of this uh, lecture and let's see if we can use, uh, if we can show that we can use composition to tell something about the specific uh, history of uh, planetary bodies, in the specific case, giant planets. It has been observed that giant planets sharing a similar, uh, the same mass among exoplanetary population can have very different densities or abundance of uh, heavy elements, where with heavy elements we indicate everything that is not hydrogen and helium. The presence of different densities has been uh, uh, interpreted as an indication that uh, these giant planets during their formation process are created uh, different amounts of solid material that was suggested to be linked to their formation in a different region for the stars. Why? Because uh, it has been shown that there is a direct correlation between the extent of migration or equivalently the distance from uh, the star at which a planet starts for, uh, its formation process and the amount of material that it can capture in its migration. In all this simulation, the planet stops its migration at 0 0.4 astronomical unit, so it becomes an old Jupiter, or more properly a warm Jupiter, uh, because its temperature will be on the order of uh, 1000 Kelvin. And uh, you can see that uh, keeping fixed uh, the final position of the planet, uh, we have uh, uh, different uh, starting points, therefore different extent of migration. And the farther away the planets form, the larger is its migration, the greater is uh, the amount of uh, heavy elements that are captured. You express in units of terrestrial masses. That would suggest that just by looking at the density and therefore the mass and radius of a giant planet, we could constrain its formation region. However, there is a complication. It's the fact that the amount of material that is captured and therefore the density of the planets depend also on the time scale on which the giant planet migrate. As you can see here, a slightly slower or faster migration time scale, sorry, a slightly faster or slower mig uh, migration time scale um, can cause uh, the giant planets to mimic the effort of informed farther away or closer to the star, introducing a degeneracy in uh, this uh, picture. We can do something better if we add the composition in terms of abundance of different elements in the picture. This was proposed uh, about 10 years ago uh, by using the C of identifying the C of error ratio, the carbon to oxygen ratio of planets uh, as a measure, as a tracer of the formation region and their migration. And, then, uh, and their migration. This is based on a very simple and powerful idea, uh, which is the fact that uh, because oxygen condenses closer to the star than the bulk of carbon, because uh, we saw a good fraction of oxygen is condensed there with the rocks and then water brings more oxygen and so CO2, while carbon start to get accreted uh, with uh, CO2 first and CO after at larger distances, the CO ratio of the gas where the oxygen is subtracted and goes in solids quicker than C, the carbon will grow linearly with distance. While the CO ratio of solids will decrease and remain subsolar for most of the extension of the disk, becoming in solar when all the carbon and oxygen are condensed into solids. However, there are two limitations to this, uh, the application of this picture. One has been highlighted by simulations uh, studying uh, the C over ratio produced uh, by different formation and migration scenario. Here, this migration is the early migration due to interaction with the disk, and this free migration can be one uh, of the mechanisms associated to the dynamical instabilities uh, producing the dynamical excitation of the planetary system that we saw. So like planetary scattering, chaotic dynamics, etc. And as you can see, 
it is possible for different uh, formation and migration scenario to produce uh, similar or even the same C over O ratio of the planet. Again, introducing a degeneracy. The other problem is that the distribution of carbon and oxygen is continuously changing while we refine our understanding of the chemistry of meteorites, comets, and generally astrophysical environments that are related to planetary formation. And if we look at the most up-to-date picture, the uh, simple to understand the C over O pattern identified by Holberg and collaborators, in reality gets a bit more complex to interpret. First, because due to the role of uh, water, rocks, and organics, uh, as highlighted by the, the cometary data, for example, uh, um, of Comet 67P and the Rosetta mission, about 60 to 70% of oxygen and carbon can be already trapped uh, in solids in the first few AU of the disk, which means that uh, by after the first few AU, the, uh, the C of the ratio of uh, solid material can be already very, very close to that of the star and can remain very clo indistinguishably close to the star for most of the extension of the disk. Similarly, the C over ratio of the gas does not, show, does not show a monotonic trend, but in reality oscillates around the value of one. This different trend makes interpreting the C over ratio a bit more difficult. This can be, uh, this difficulty, however, can be uh, bypassed uh, if we expand the, uh, the suite of elements that we can use uh, to um, trace uh, the formation and migration history of planets. Uh, an example that I will use uh, to illustrate you how we can do this, uh, coming from a recent work that we did in the framework of the Ariel mission, uses nitrogen and sulfur as two additional elements. Nitrogen, because it is characterized by a higher volatility than carbon as oxygen. As I showed you before, the, in the first part, a uh, part of nitrogen is, is uh, trapped into solids by ammonia, but the vast majority of nitrogen remain as a gas in the disk and condense only very far away from the disk as N2. Sulfur, on the other hand, is uh, incorporated into solids very early in the disk and the bulk of sulfur is in refractory form in rocks already from the first few U. So it has a lower volatility than carbon and oxygen. If we put these um, tracers into our simulation of the interaction of a migrating uh, and accreting giant planets in a planetesimal disk, and we trace the accretion of gas and planetesimal by the giant planets, uh, and we decompose uh, the material that is accreted uh, across the different region and we compute the, comp the, the contribution of the four elements of the of gas and solids to the four elements, we see that actually the C over ratio for planets forming at tens to hundreds of astronomical units, each symbol is uh, the starting point of the giant planets in this set of simulation, you can see that the C over ratio provides very limited information of the distance at which the giant planet formed from the star. The two, profile, the two curves that you can find here in green and violet are uh, basically flat. The purple indicates bodies that accrete both gas and solids and which a significant fraction of uh, the metallicity, the abundance of LV elements is contributed by solids. The green curve instead is for planets that create only gas and derive only the metallicity, therefore the fraction of heavy elements from the gas. We can distinguish, thanks to the C over O ratio, one regime from the other, but we can tell where the planet formed. We can add more color to, our, to the picture, to go back to the analogy with which we started this lecture, if we consider the C over N, carbon over nitrogen, and N over O, nitrogen over oxygen ratios. As you can see, the two curves are not flat. They show monotonic trends, increasing or decreasing depending on whether you are dominated by the accretion of gas or with a significant contribution of solids, and whether you are considering C over N or N over O. But you can see that the values deviate from the stellar values the more, uh, the further away the planet starts its formation from the star.
in a monotonic way. In the case of the C over N ratio, because inside, uh, rocks traps very little carbon and uh, basically even less uh, nitrogen, carbon and nitrogen are all in gas form in the innermost regions of the disk. So planets that form uh, start their formation and migration closer to the star might capture all the carbon and nitrogen mainly through the gas, bringing the C over N ratio to be very close to the stellar value. And therefore, not being able to deconvolve whether our planet created only gas or a significant fraction of solid. This doesn't happen with the N over O ratio, however, because as we saw, a certain fraction of oxygen is always trapped into rocks, it might be 50 or might be 20%, depending on how close to the star the rocks formed. But while nitrogen is basically all in gas form close to the star, oxygen is always subsolar in the gas and the fraction is trapped into the rocks as the meteorites tell us. So the end of the ratio of uh, giant planets are creating a, a significant fraction of solids and planets dominating, uh, dominated only by the accretion of gas uh, will never converge to the same value. And again, you have monotonic trends deviating from the stellar values, the more, the farther away the giant planet formed. So the more it migrated. I spoke about four elements I took only uh, at the beginning and I showed plots only for three. What happens when we consider only also sulfur? Basically, sulfur, as I said, has a lower volatility than carbon and oxygen, and therefore also nitrogen, when nitrogen has a higher volatility. As a, as a, as a result, for most of the extension of the disk, nitrogen can uh, be considered as a tracer only of the gas while sulfur can be considered as a tracer of the solids. If we look at the curve of the S over N ratio and the curve of the accretion of solids, we see that they share the same shape. So basically, the S over N ratio traces the accretion of solid materials, so planetesimal, by the giant planet. The violet curve, instead, show uh, the total metallicity of a giant planet that is a mixture, the combination of the, metal, the contribution of heavy elements by solids, planetesimals, and gas. For very high metallicity, the main source are the planetesimals, as you can see for very large migration, and the two curves basically overlap. So if we have the estimation of the sulfur over nitrogen ratio, and we compare it with the metallicity that we can estimate from the density or the mass radius relationship of a giant planet. And the two match, we know, and we have a confirmation that the giant planet formed far away from the star and accreted the, most of these uh, heavy elements through solids. However, you can see that in the innermost region, because, uh, because the contribution, the mass accreted in terms of solids decreases, the contribution of heavy elements of the gas becomes comparable to that of solids. In this case, the metallicity derived through the mass radius relationship will be higher than that derived through the sulfur over nitrogen ratio. Therefore, the, the use of this uh, uh, elemental ratio as an additional color in our picture allows to further discriminate between uh, the two regions whether the, the metallicity is mostly dominated by the accretion of solids or is contributed both by gas and solids. With this, I conclude. I'm pretty sure that you will have a number of things that have been unclear because we had to pack a lot of uh, different subjects and uh, information from different disciplines into a short lesson of one hour. So if you have any question, there will be a live question time where you can ask everything that you are unclear. If you want to send me question ahead of the live question time so that uh, you are sure that you get your response uh, by the time of the live question time, feel free to do so. Here you have my email address and see you in a couple of days.